Hello, everybody. Welcome to our broadcast today. I'm Pastor Steve Green. My wife, Penny, and I pastor here at Breton Word of Faith Church, and today is Sunday, February 27th. The theme that we're studying now for several weeks is called Redeemed from the Curse of the Law, which is a wonderful, enjoyable, amazing subject, talking about the, the terrible things that God has, that Jesus has redeemed us from uh, by his crucifixion. Praise God. Our subject uh, title today is He Sent His Word and Healed Them. And so one of the many benefits of being redeemed from the curse of the law is that we have healing for the physical body. And there's a scripture that I want to include with that. And, and of course, Galatians 3.13 would be a logical choice. And we've used that one. That's where it says Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. However, today I want to go to Psalm 107 and verse 20, which says, He sent His word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. So our objective is in this uh, series and today is that we would be whole, that we would be whole and healthy, you and I, uh, throughout our being on the inside and on the outside. On the inside means in our soul and on the outside means in our physical body. And one of the things um, that we understand about healing is that the more our soul is prosperous, the more our soul is properly functioning, the more that we're whole on the inside, the more that tends to being whole also on the outside. And so there's the connection between the two. And that connection is the one that is prominent in the book of Galatians, where we find Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. And so we want to explore these things, examine these things, and boy is it rich. There's a whole treasure chest full of uh, rich uh, Bible truth for us in this area, um, uh, particularly out of the book of Galatians. And so, uh, as we just read in Psalm 107, he sent his word and healed them. And now, that would be his word regarding healing in particular, but it would also be his, uh, the entirety of his word. All of his word tends to have a healing impact on our physical body. We see the same thing in Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 to 23. Uh, he says, My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those that find them and health to all their flesh. So the words uh, are all the words of God being referred to here. These words are life to those that find them. And that life is referring not only to, but predominantly to the inner life, the life on the inside of us. And so these words are life to those that find them and health to all their flesh. So that kind of health that we're talking about there is the kind of health uh, to our flesh. There's an inner kind of health, but there's an outer kind of health. And thank God that the Word of God ministers to the entirety of our being. It says in verse 23, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. So the Word of God finds its place, finds its home in our heart, and we're to guard our heart with all diligence. So uh, with those with those two verses in mind, let's also read Galatians 3 and verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And so Jesus, very obviously from this verse, was cursed when he hung on the cross. And the purpose of that cursing was in order for him to bear the load, to take the curse that belonged to all of us because of our unrighteousness, our failure to live up to the standards of the law. And the law, as we're as it's referred to in the book of Galatians, as it is in many places in the Bible, is referring to the law of Moses in particular, the law that came to Moses from God on Mount Sinai. Uh, there were, uh, by the count of some people, 613 different commands that were given to Moses that day, 10 of which were written by the finger of God on tablets of stone. So, uh, now, now, the, if we were to look at this verse, Galatians 3.13, uh, just physically, uh, just its outward appearance, either on our uh, tablet or our handheld device or uh, a physical Bible, uh, the, the verse itself 
uh, is going to take up some space um, and it's going to be part of a larger collection of words and sentences. So in the very same way that the verse itself is a small part of a bigger document, uh, similarly healing, which is being referred to by that verse, healing fits in with a larger relational uh, structure and understanding with God. So, so um, as uh, we gain that larger relational understanding of God, healing is going to fit into that. Now, as that larger relational understanding finds a place in our heart, then healing will click right in to that larger relational understanding right in our heart. And as we believe it in our heart, then it manifests in our physical body. Praise God. So there's, uh, that's just a way of looking at it, of understanding what it is that we're endeavoring to do here, what it is that the book of Galatians is endeavoring to do, what God is doing through that book. So let's have a look at our whiteboard again. Now it's been <clears throat> updated. It's the same whiteboard as before. But it has a few more details and a few, uh, it's been edited a little bit and adjusted a little bit um, in order to be um, more, more informational, uh, but also a little more accurate. So, so what this is, is a, is a graphical presentation of the Bible and the New Testament in particular. Now, of course, just on a whatever, roughly four by six, um, whiteboard, we're not going to get everything in the Bible. In fact, many, many things are left out. Many important things are left out. But what this is designed to uh, present to us is the essence of the gospel, the core, the, the very basic structure, the skeleton, we could say and have said, uh, of the gospel. Uh, so it is the underlying structure of the New Testament. It is the underlying structure of the gospel because the gospel and the New Testament are the same thing. Uh, the New Testament is also known as the New Covenant. Um, it's also known as the Kingdom of Heaven or the Kingdom of God. And so all of these things are identical to one another uh, and and this whiteboard is endeavoring to uh, show us the rough outline um, of these various things um, in order that we it would be clear to us in order that the the the, str the flow would be plain to us in order that we would have a clear understanding of our calling what it is we need to do where our focus needs to be uh, the role that God plays the role that we play the results that we can expect um, these are all the uh, different things that we can see from observing this structure here. Uh, we can tell if we are in the will of God in terms of how we are living our lives. Um, it gives us focus and direction. These are the purposes of us having the whiteboard. And so it begins with the Christ, of course, and He is, everything hinges on Him, everything comes from Him, everything is for Him, it's all about Him. He is the absolute center of everything that we read in the New Testament. He was crucified for us. He was resurrected. And He is the authority. The word Christ uh, means anointed one, of course, but the anointed one is the one who's authorized. So practically, it's referring to authority. And in particular, not only is Christ the authority uh, with regard to righteousness, in other words, what right living is, what the best standard of living is, the, the wisest, most effective, most productive, most beneficial um, manner of living, which is righteousness. He is the authority on righteousness. And He is the authority as opposed to other authorities. Uh, we are not to follow other authorities on that subject. And so the Christ has spoken to us. Very simply, He has spoken words. And we have these words written in the New Testament. Uh, his actual words, um, predominantly in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then all the other words of the New Testament were words inspired by Him, uh, supplementary to what He spoke in the four Gospels, and they also are His words um, being spoken and written through um, other people. So His words would be the way that His authority is expressed. So it would be His words and not other standards of righteousness. Now that little word, N-O-T, we see it repeated here, not other authorities, not other standards of righteousness. Faith 
um, in Him, not law. The help of the Holy Spirit, not flesh. So that word not, it's underlined in all four places. And although it's a little word, it's, a, it's an extremely significant word um, as in terms of what it's communicating to us here because there's an exclusive, Christ has an exclusive claim to righteousness. He has an exclusive claim to the words of righteousness. He has an exclusive claim to faith and it is only through Him that the Holy Spirit works. And He is the only author of righteousness, the only author of true divine love. He's the only author of the true obedience. And so it's Him to the exclusion of everything else. Now, uh, that exclusion is where a person like me and you too, if you are sharing the Word of God with people, but it's where people like us can get into trouble because people um, very often are willing to listen to just about anything you might have to say. But it's when you begin to use the word not, that it begins to step on their toes because it means, and not that we're trying to step on people's toes, and we don't want to step on people's toes. We don't want to cause any trouble. Um, but, but that word not is essential to the message, and, and that is where, um, where the, the ideas and philosophies and ideas and attitudes that of, of people that are, do not fit within uh, what Christ spoke, that is where they're exposed as false. And, and it's at that point that sometimes um, people may wish to no longer uh, be speaking with you, or they may wish to be offended <laughs> at you for what you've just said. But the, again, the reason we do it is not uh, in order to be offensive to anybody at all, but rather to chart out the one and only course that leads to that leads to a pure heart and ultimately leads to life, leads to salvation, leads to the abundant life. Now, um, prior to uh, what is seen on this whiteboard, there is the new birth. And in fact, we can use the whiteboard to illustrate the new birth. Um, but this whiteboard, as we're looking at it right now, um, is assuming that, that you and I are born again. We're our, we've already accepted Christ, and the issue now isn't how to get saved in the first place. The issue isn't how to be made righteous in the first place, but now the issue is how to live. And so that's what the whiteboard is all about, is how to live, how to live a righteous life, how to live a beneficial, productive life, how to live a life that matters for eternity. Praise God. So just to very briefly um, uh, <clears throat> uh, review the whiteboard again. So it's going to be about the Christ. It's going to be about His words that He spoke and the fact that you and I have the opportunity, uh, having believed in Him, to be saved in the first place, to now continue to believe in Him or have faith in Him regarding how we live. And so faith is going to be based on the words of Jesus, not law. And again, that's extremely significant. Um, law, as we understand it, is, as we mentioned earlier, is referring to the law of Moses which was for the Jews and as such is prototypical of every law that Gentiles might have because it isn't just Jews who had a law and theirs has been the law of Moses, but it's all people everywhere who follow some kind of standard, some kind of idea, some kind of philosophy, some kind of strategy for living, be it a good one or a bad one, be it it's one that appears to be working or one that does not appear to be working. Everybody everywhere has some kind of um, approach to life and the law of Moses is prototypical of that because the law of Moses worked by flesh and and so every human strategy also works by flesh and is doomed to failure because of that so what faith does though is faith engages the help of the Holy Spirit, not the strength of human ability, not flesh, but the help of the Holy Spirit. Wherever there's faith, there's going to be the help of the Holy Spirit joining with that faith. The two are intimately connected. We see that in the book of Galatians. Faith can, can involve different things, different ways to engage the help of the Holy Spirit. Primarily, it is by yielding, just believing in His words and stepping out to do, yielding to His words. We believe in them, we yield, and the moment we begin to yield, the Holy Spirit takes hold together with us. Other ways 
uh, biblical ways that, that we engage, further engage the help of the Holy Spirit is by faith understanding our identity in Christ, believing that we are the person who God made us to be in the new birth. Another way is by making confessions, confessing the Word of God, confessing uh, th by faith, confessing our intention, our ability, our willingness to do and be obedient to the Word of God. Um, here's a good one. It, the Bible says God delights in mercy. And so that's a good confession for us. We can probably, all of us, become more merciful, just using an example. And so that would be a good confession, saying, I delight in mercy. I delight in mercy, just as it comes to mind as we think of it, just saying it out loud. Now that engages the help of the Holy Spirit. So there's, there's several ways here in which faith engages the help of the Holy Spirit. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, which is also called grace in the Bible, um, he leads us. This is how the Spirit, the, the, there's, I know the, the leading of the Spirit is a big subject and, and, and there's some pitfalls associated with it. The primary way that we are led by the Spirit is into doing the words of Jesus. And it isn't always taught that way, but that is the way it is taught in the Bible, is that the, the main focus of the Holy Spirit is going to be to draw our attention to His words, His words down here, and in, in and in fact to doing His words, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, not by the power of our own flesh, we in fact can do the various things Jesus has asked us to do. We can put action to our faith. We can, um, we can perform the things that God has instructed, that Jesus has instructed, concerning righteousness. Now everything on the whiteboard again is concerning how we live, how to live. It's concerning the subject of righteousness. What is right living as opposed to wrong living? What is the kind of living that will produce produce divine results. And so the right kind of living is called righteousness in the Bible. Uh, righteousness is a gift that's given us back in the beginning when we first come to Christ, but the same word is used to describe righteous living. Love is another word frequently used for the very same thing. Obedience is another word, and they're all identically the same. There is no distinction that we're making between these different words. And so the benefit of doing His words is each time it can be just a simple thing. Uh, we, we used the example a moment ago of having mercy, of making a confession that I delight in mercy. Mercy. I may find an opportunity even today to, to show some mercy to somebody. So now I'm putting action to my faith. I'm doing what he said. And that, it, and that produces the result of me drawing near to God. By, by doing the things that God has asked me to do, I'm now drawing near to him. And the, the same actions are having a cleansing effect on my heart. And so as my heart is being cleansed, I am coming to have a pure heart. Now the way we've drawn it here, it's an, it's, we've drawn it as if it's a 100% pure. But as you can well imagine, this is a process because it, it works step by step by step. And so our heart is in the process of being purified, which means we're being sanctified. We're, we're being made holy. These are all different Bible words. And this is one of the benefits of the whiteboard is we can get overwhelmed with multiple Bible words that we may not be 100% clear on what the definition is, and it can just be all too much. But, but there's a simplification here, an accurate simplification, where we're seeing that to have a pure heart is the same as being sanctified. It's the same as being made holy. The Bible also refers to it as being for perfected. Jesus said, take the plank out of your own eye first. So having a pure heart is, our, the plank is being removed from our eye. Christ is being formed in us, uh, as we read in the book of Galatians. Um, Paul said in Galatians 4.19 that his purpose is that Christ would be formed in them. And so, uh, the, Jesus refers to as the pure heart as um, he calls it different things. He calls it the good eye. He calls it the good soil. He calls it the good tree. The good eye means we have the ability to see and know spiritually. The more I can see what's at stake, the more I tend to want to do His words. Uh, and so this becomes a very positive um, cycle that I can get into. Uh, there are numerous positive cycles or several positive cycles that are here on the whiteboard. Um, another one is the more that I do His words, each time I do His words, the more I engage the help of the Holy Spirit, who then helps me do His words, which causes me to engage the help. And this is a very positive uh, cycle to get into, all of which is, notice how um, these reinforce the 
the idea of doing His words. Um, the more I have the Holy Spirit operating, the more the Bible says He reminds me of the words of Jesus. And so, um, as we take steps along this route, um, there is a circling back as we get to better and, and higher places, then there's more power being generated for us to go to, to propel the whole um, the whole relationship forward. Uh, <clears throat> and so the good soil, now as my heart is being purifi purified, it's becoming better soil combined with the words of God produces more. Again, there's, uh, this is another way of things cycling around and giving more momentum, giving more strength to what God is doing in our life. And the final result of it is that we become a good tree, which means we produce good fruit. Everything that stems from the tree is fruit. And so this is what the Bible calls love from a pure heart. Um, here by faith I'm taking steps of love. As my heart is purified, then love becomes more of a natural um, instinct. It becomes more of an easy flow. It becomes more of what I habitually do. And so love from a true heart, um, I said true heart here, um, actually, the, the word I intended to use was a pure heart there. I'll correct that after we're done today. This is from 1 Timothy, I believe, chapter 1, verse 5, speaking about love from a pure heart. Um, so, uh, living under divine discipline would be a characteristic. Now, I'm just... Uh, I found my place in the Spirit, how to live, and, and it's, it's a disciplined way of living, and I like it. It is a far better way of living. I know sometimes people don't like discipline, but this is a kind of discipline that is the most enjoyable kind of discipline because it lifts me to a whole higher level. I am making relational environments for discipleship. In other words, I'm very conscious of the people around me, and I'm very conscious that everything I do either positively contributes to or detracts from the environment, the relational environment that I have with people, um, and, and the degree to which the Holy Spirit can work through me to attract people to Jesus, be they saved or unsaved. And so um, the results of being uh, a good tree are um, good fruit. I have answered prayer. I have better answers to prayer, more frequent answers to prayer. I'm able to make disciples. I have the fruit of the Spirit. I have salvation, which is not the initial salvation of being born again, as I think you know, but it is referring to the quality of life that we're living here on earth. It's the abundant life. We're living in His love. We're entering His rest. These are biblical terms. I have effective authority over the devil. Okay, so that is, that is our uh, New Testament in a nutshell. Praise the Lord. So, um, I think I'll continue standing here. And so, <clears throat> we have the battle lines drawn then. Now, and this is really helpful for us to see, um, is that everything about the New Testament, everything about this um, graphical presentation revolves around uh, doing His words. This is the key thing. Uh, everything leading up to it is to empower me to do His words. Once I am doing His words, all the other things tend to happen as a matter of course. They tend to flow. Um, so the whole issue is if we do His words, we win. If we don't do His words, we lose. That is, in a nutshell, that's what the message is. That's what Jesus Himself said. He, he said that if, you, if we do His words, then the storms will come and we'll stand. But if we don't do His words, it doesn't matter who we claim to be, it doesn't matter if we're in the kingdom or out of the kingdom, if we don't do His words, then the storms will come and we'll fall. Uh, and so that is the simple black and white basic truth of the whole matter. And so that's why we have the doing His words at the top. We have it in the center. We have it in a different color. Uh, we have it circled. 
<laughs> we've done, we have it in capital letters, we have, we've done everything we can do to highlight the fact that, that this is the key. And another thing that we have very well highlighted is the pure heart. We have obviously a heart drawn around there, we have it in capital letters, we also have it in a separate color because this is a huge, huge, huge benefit of us doing the Word of God. And it's, it's, this is the primary product of doing the Word of God and all the many things of the kingdom tend to flow out, just run out, pour out of a pure heart, including all of these many benefits here. And so um, our whiteboard isn't just words, but, but the location and the style of presentation is part of the meaning. So, so there's going to be a fight over doing his words. Um, that is where, this is where the battle lines are drawn. This is, this is more than anything what the devil wants to, wants to stop. Um, and it isn't just the devil, but it's the world around us, um, this present evil world. It's also our own flesh. Um, our flesh tends to steer us um, away from doing His words. So we've got uh, all these forces illustrated here empowering us upward into the performance of His words and there are other forces that are endeavoring to set up a blockade uh, in order to stop this from happening. So this is where the battle is going to be. Um, Paul calls it the good fight of faith. It, to Timothy he said to fight the good fight of faith. And so it helps us to understand the nature of this battle because you and I have all experienced that we know the competing forces. We've experienced them. Uh, they're part of our life. Now two things about the Word of God. Uh, his words the words of Jesus, or in particular, or the Word of God in general, is that it reveals and it heals. Two, two key functions of the Word of God is it reveals and it heals. Now, the revealing function of the Word of God is one that many people don't appreciate because it reveals the heart of man. It shows what is beneath the surface. It shows what is not right beneath the surface. It shows all that is wrong with us. And as you can readily imagine, not everybody wants to know what is wrong. In fact, um, it can not only uh, at times do we not want to know what is wrong, but it can produce a very strong reaction from within a person uh, saying, I don't want to be talking about that, I don't want to know about that. Um, <clears throat> however, if we are willing to allow His words to reveal our heart, the same words also heal our heart and make it pure in this case, make it functional, make it, make it very productive where we can fulfill our purpose for living. And so the price we're paying is very small compared to the benefit that we're getting. And so it's good to be aware though. It's good to understand. It's good to, to understand, okay, I want my heart revealed. It's good to come to that conclusion rather than recoil uh, recoil when there is something being revealed in us that we don't like the look of. So, so a couple of things. The, the Word of God will reveal ignorance in us, and ignorance isn't necessarily a bad thing, it's not a good thing, but it just means we don't know yet. And so everybody is ignorant about something. Um, and so that, that's an issue. But as we've been discussing, the Word of God reveals what we call unresolved heart issues. It reveals the heart. Now, we'll just use a lot of words to describe what these heart issues are so we can get a, an idea of what it is that we're talking about. Um, it's thoughts and intents of the heart, as it says in Hebrews chapter 12. We're talking about hurts that have been unresolved. Um, Hang-ups, uh, habits, these are normal, normal um, factors in people's lives. There's nothing strange or unusual about these things. Everybody, according to the Bible, has these things. Um, and now we might be dealing with them um, to, a, to a greater or lesser degree, um, but, but these are things we all have to deal with. Now, a hang-up, uh, I like this definition, it is an emotional inhibition. So a hang-up is where I am inhibited, uh, as it applies to us, it's, a, it's where we are inhibited from doing the 
Word of God, and it's an emotional inhibition, meaning we can't, we, it may not even be conscious, it might not even be anything we can explain, it might not be anything we can put words to, but it's just something that it's, there's an emotional reaction when the issue is brought up, when the words are brought up, there's an emotional reaction, and, and that, uh, that reaction is to reject the Word of God in that area. So hurts, um, hang-ups, habits, these are, are things that hinder the Word of God. Another key thing uh, mentioned and also in the book of Galatians chapter 5 and verse 24 uh, regarding the flesh is passions and desires. Um, it's not unusual. In fact, everybody to some degree has um, ungodly passions and desires. And, and just to be very plain, about it. Let's just make a list of different things, not a complete list, but illicit sex would be one. Um, there's a good, it's just probably no secret to anybody, that uh, illicit, illicit sex, sex outside the bounds of the Word of God, sex inappropriate, unholy, ungodly, uh, sexual relations, sexual activity of any kind, um, including viewing pornography, um, this has a big appeal to many people, and and some people uh, will reject God in because they they know that God um, is going to take a stand against that, and and they just desire it. They want it. It's a passion, and it's a, and it becomes the number one passion. Um, so these would, could also be called lusts. We're talking about these are inhibitions. These are. Um, uh, adversaries, these are opponents to us, um, they're against us doing the Word of God. Um, at, some are, people are going to have a lust for power, or it can be a lust for money, or a lust for glory, or needing to be important, or needing to be better than other people. It's hard to love other people if my main heart objective is to be better than, to compete with them, to beat them, because I have some kind of an inner need. I, have a, I, I rely on being better, or at least imagining myself to be better than other people in order to feel good about myself. Um, um, there can be anti-authority feelings. This could easily be part of what we call a hang-up, <laughs> where there's just a, sometimes there's an emotional response against authority. Um, and it may not even make sense, but it's there. Resentments against other people, anger. There's just a long list of things that can fall under the category of passions and desires. It's where there is something wrong in our heart, something wrong beneath the surface. Uh, it can be areas, we mentioned hurts already, it can be an area of woundedness, a touchiness, where we just do not want anybody to go there, including God, including His Word. Um, it can be stubbornness, pride, resentment. Um, Resentment toward authority, as we mentioned already, a need to be in control. Um, that is a huge one. Uh, I believe people everywhere are fighting to have more control, <clears throat> more control in their lives. And, and that would work against giving control to God. Um, uh, blindness and hardness of heart. Um, areas that do not want to be touched just places where we are systematically disobedient. This is where the problem is going to be. Now, none of this is mentioned, and please let me emphasize this, none of this is mentioned uh, in order to condemn. None of this is mentioned in order to, uh, you know, make us feel bad or, or to uh, make this sort of an unhappy study today. But we're, what we're dealing, we're just being plain and clear. This is, these are the actual um, issues that we face. These are the uh, barriers that we need to overcome. And now the good news is that we have everything we see on the whiteboard here um, to help us, primarily the help of the Holy Spirit to overcome all the um, adversities and do what it is that Jesus asked us to do, to do it successfully. Praise God. So the Word of God, as we act upon it, will unleash the power of the Holy Spirit, which will propel us into doing His words. And, and that, in turn, and we don't have to 
beyond doing his words, we don't have to do anything for our heart to be purified. Doing his words is the thing that purifies our heart. So this is now happening automatically. And, and, and my heart is being healed, we could say. My heart is being made whole. My heart is being restored. Um, and all of the various things that have found a home in our, my heart that shouldn't be there, that have hindered me in my life, are now being removed from my heart. So it's a very, very happy outcome. Uh, the Word of God is cleansing. It makes my heart pure. It is therapy. Um, it, it heals. It restores. It makes functional. It is the only means. The Word of God is the only means of producing excellent results in my life. Faith does not struggle for the mastery. That's the thing about law is, and, and law again referring to the hundreds or thousands of different strategies and uh, philosophies of people and how to live. Um, <clears throat> faith, all, all of these involve trying to gain some kind of mastery over a system or a, or a scheme um, or a strategy. Um, <clears throat> But faith is the opposite of that. Faith is not trying to gain the mastery over anything. Rather, it's letting Jesus having the, have the direct mastery over me to allow him to speak um, to my heart um, what he wants me to do and to direct, to control, to steer me according to his word. So it is not under my control. It is under his control, which is why it becomes powerful and effective. Anything under human control is doomed to failure. Uh, so that is a good feature of faith. Faith steps up and assumes its responsibilities. Faith is a response to his word, which is our response, which includes our responsibilities in the covenant. Faith cuts through the manic world of confusion characterized by uh, ignorance, by human reasons, excuses for not doing the right thing, blaming other people, uh, false doctrines that would indicate we don't need to actually do His Word in order to be blessed, um, uh, passions and desires like we talked about. Faith in Him just cuts right through, goes right to the issue, goes right to the answer, does exactly the right thing and produces exactly the right result. Faith is a wonderful, beautiful thing. Faith is characterized by an honest heart, an open heart, uh, as, uh, as opposed to, again, excuses, blaming other people. Faith is um, open, honest, it's true. There's a wholeheartedness to faith. Praise God. Praise God. Uh, faith just acknowledges the truth. For example, um, if I need to have more mercy in my life toward other people, faith will say, well, there it is. That's what we need to do. I'll make my confession. I delight in faith, and away we go. So faith is true. It's honest. It's open. Law is a shift. I'll see how we're doing for time. Now, uh, We'll finish with this um, today, just for the sake of time. Um, law, whereas, whereas faith will follow the focus of the words of Jesus, what Jesus is intending, what he's wanting through his words, faith will be true to that. Law will always shift the focus onto some other standard of righteousness, some other something else that may appear good on the surface, um, but really is not really does not engage the help of the Holy Spirit and and therefore does not produce the right results and again this is typified by the law of Moses the law of Moses 613 different laws um, it has the appearance of righteousness but it does not engage the help of the Holy Spirit and it does not perform righteousness so it be it becomes empty it becomes dead it becomes ineffectual and that would be true not just of the law of Moses but of all uh, human strategies for righteousness, whatever we may imagine righteousness to be. Uh, so law is a shift in the message or focus and um, our necessary way of following the Lord. It is the enemy of faith. Um, it operates by flesh. 
Law and flesh, just the same way as faith and spirit are intimately connected, law and flesh are intimately connected. And so law is always going to be performed by the strength of the flesh. It is an alternate form of righteousness. So again, it's a distraction. It's a shift. It is many times it's a subtle thing. Many times it masks the heart because there's a superficial appearance of goodness when in fact the heart has not been cleansed and is not being cleansed. Uh, law will, perpet will, will permit and perpetuate unrighteousness and it exacerbates the bad results. Instead of getting these results, law will ensure no matter how hard we're trying, no matter how good we're looking um, uh, or trying to look, law will always produce um, bad results in our life. Uh, it neutralizes God's good intentions. Okay, faith, faith is, as we said, glorious, it's beautiful, it's pure, it is, it is, it is such a, an infinitely superior way of living than according to law. And again, law is what human beings everywhere are living according to other than those who have been born again, other than those who have accepted Jesus as their Lord, other than those who not only have been saved by faith, but are now also learning to live by faith. Praise God. Thank you for joining us today. There is so much here. As I said, there's a treasure chest of, of wonderful things and it, it just takes a little bit of time to, to get to them. I wish I could open my mouth and just say it all in a few minutes. <laughs> but thank you for joining us today and join us again next week. Praise the Lord.